Hello, this is Matthew Knight. Hey, Matthew, Hello. how are you? Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Michelle is yeah. there also. Oh, great. Yes. It's good to hear you. So, um, as I told you, Matthew, on the context, uh, it's a doctorate program, which is working only with the elite of uh, general managers and uh, CEOs of big companies. So we have a program which has around uh, 15 people, not more. And uh, for example, the person that you see in the middle, Antoine, Antoine and Zengue, uh, works, uh, runs a company of uh, several thousand of employees in Africa uh, in uh, oil and gas. It's Neptune Oil. And I know, Matthew, that you, uh, that you sold um, some robots to uh, BP, I think, in Norway, something like this. So all these people are interested in their personal research and their company uh, in what you do. Uh, we know that uh, Boston Dynamics is a really famous and great uh, company. We are happy to uh, collaborate with. So if you want to introduce yourself, what you do, what Boston Dynamics do, uh, does, this is the main ideas of the, uh, the next 30 minutes. No, oh, that's great. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for having me. What I'll do, I'll share my screen. And I've tried to put together, I'll, I'll try the video, um, but I just worry about if that degrades the audio, I'll just turn it off. Um, but nice to see everyone and thank you very much for having me. Um, what I'll do, I'll share my screen and we'll run through, uh, you know, my goal for this discussion, if everyone can see it all right. Um, my goal for this discussion was really to um, give a pretty good idea on, uh, you know, what we see for applications for robotics, a little bit of background on Boston Dynamics um, that I think could be interesting, uh, and then leave some time at the end for questions, if that works for everyone. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much. So I guess we'll get started. Um, you know, I'm not sure the familiarity in the room of Boston Dynamics uh, but, you know, most folks sort of know us from YouTube videos like this. Um, so this is our humanoid robot atlas. It's purely a research project, um, but we really focus on trying to tackle some of the most difficult robotics challenges um, with a two-legged robot that has superhuman strength. Um, and we take the learnings from that and sort of bring that down into um, the products that we look to bring to market. Um, so I don't think that we'll see Atlas commercialized anytime soon, but, um, you know, we, the things that we've learned, uh, with that robot have been really beneficial for the, the products that we brought to market. Um, historically, the company has always been focused on legged robotics. Um, and this is the first robot that we got out into the world, uh, called Big Dog. And, you know, the whole idea behind this and then future robots, like the next one that you'll see is LS3, it could carry 800 pounds of payloads and packs uh, for soldiers in the field. The whole idea of this was getting robots to be able to operate in unknown, unstructured, and even antagonistic type environments um, where they didn't know they, where they were going to be. They were constantly stabilizing. And then about a half a dozen years ago, we started to think, you know, what if we could reduce the form factor of the robot um, so it could operate someday in human purposed environments, doing human purpose tasks. And that's where the original idea of Spot Mini came from. Uh, and this is, was a robot that we moved to from hydraulic actuation to electric actuation. Uh, we moved, you know, from diesel power to electric power. Uh, and we wanted to be able to operate in, in, in and around people, uh, but also make sure that we maintained uh, the reliability, the durability, and the ability to go in really difficult environments. Um, so I don't think you're going to see a robot doing your dishes or your laundry uh, from us anytime <laughs> soon. Um, but, you know, we are looking forward to be bringing the ability to manipulate environments at some point. Um, so that's a little bit of the history of the company. Uh, and then, you know, a couple years ago, we started to look at actually commercializing for the first time. 
uh, and we were trying to figure out, you know, what types of um, environments do people want to see robotics? And we sort of came down to the three, three main things that are pretty common. One is environments that are just unsafe for people to be in. Um, so a CBRNE type environment, a nuclear generation facility, a mine, all those types of things where you just don't want people to be there from a safety standpoint. Uh, and you can accomplish a task with a robot. Uh, the other thing that we've seen is sort of logistically challenging environments. So think about a substation and an electric utility that's five hours away from anybody or an offshore oil rig where you need to take a team and fly them out uh, to be able to do a task or sometimes just to inspect something that came up as an alarm. Um, you know, what if you could one day have a robot living out there and you could teleoperate into it and you know you could drive you could basically drive it around and do the inspection. And then the third piece that we think is really interesting for robotics is bringing a level of automation into an environment that really wasn't built for automation. So when when folks make manufacturing facilities or uh, oil and gas rigs today there's a mindset that people won't necessarily be there to be doing the basic tasks. So they're built with robotics in mind. But 50 years ago, the idea of automation and robotics wasn't a real thing. So they were built for people. So they had stairs, they had pipes that you need to step over, um, even something as simple as maybe a curb. Um, so that's an area where we think we could bring some value just due to the fact that the robot that we've brought to market has legs. Um, it can go up and down stairs. It can go over gravel and all those types of things. Um, so that sort of brings us to, um, you know, to Spot, which is sort of the first, the first robot that we've brought to market. Um, and this is, this is the robot. Um, so if you look at it, uh, it weighs about 70 pounds. I think that's 30 kilos or so. Uh, it has a 90 minute battery life. So a field swappable battery that you pop in and out. Um, and it also has sort of 360 view of its environment. So, you know, you have stereo cameras in the front, either side and in the rear. Um, this is how the robot sees the world uh, and how the robot's identifying, you know, what it should be stepping on versus what it should be maneuvering around. Um, I'll show you a little bit later uh, how the robot does sort of automated um, obstacle avoidance. And, and the whole idea behind this is a couple things. One, being terrain agnostic. So being able to go into an environment um, that you and I as people um, don't really think much about. You know, we walk up and down stairs, um, we walk over curves, we walk on grass, we walk on gravel, um, you know, with, with limited challenge. So the idea is being able to bring a robot there. And then bringing a robot into that environment um, doesn't necessarily do anything unless you have some type of a sensor platform or a payload uh, built on top of it. So we've built Spot to be sensor agnostic, meaning you can mount up to 14 kilograms of different sensors on the robot. Uh, so in this case, you'll see you know, a 360 camera, a pan tilt zoom camera, so you can see the environment, uh, understand what's going on in the environment, in addition to that, we have different partnerships with different companies that have mounted, you know, thermal cameras, or in this case, a LIDAR, additional compute. Um, and the whole idea behind this is, you know, we wanted to build this mobility platform that then could be configurable. Uh, and if you wanted to add a computer vision model uh, onto the robot, you could do that. If you wanted to define the robot's behaviors based on, you know, gesture commands with your hand, you can do that. Um, so it's got a Python-based uh, API. Um, so we've had folks that have integrated into different software platforms to go do inspections on, in plants. Um, we've had folks that have um, done voice commands. So tell the robot to move forward or integrate it into GPS. So you could drive it on a particular path down to centimeters of accuracy. Um, we've also seen some sort of fun type of applications, and I'll show you a video that just came out uh, yesterday, if you can see this. Um, so I don't know if you're getting the audio uh, or not, but this is 20 robots 
that uh, we're dancing at the Fukuoka Hawks game uh, yesterday. There are no uh, fans in the stands. So to get a little bit of excitement during the seventh inning stretch, um, we basically set up this dance routine uh, for the robots to operate in sort of a, a group fashion. So again, sort of sort of fun stuff. I, I don't know if the audio was coming through there. What, no, that's what Okay, yeah, the audio makes it even more exciting, but you can see it on, on YouTube. Um, but the idea of this is, you know, having a fleet of robots all doing the same thing at the same time. While the dance is really fun and like cool to see from an entertainment standpoint, um, there are also some pretty interesting potential applications uh, in the business world of uh, having fleet management. You know, if there is uh, some type of an issue in a plant to have robots going out to a particular locations to check on things, make sure that valves have been, been pulled, uh, breakers have been pulled, all those types of things. Um, so the whole idea when, when we built the, the robot to be an open platform was, you know, we, we weren't crazy enough to think that we would know every application that people wanted to use the robot for. And when I first heard the entertainment application, I sort of laughed it, laughed it off a little bit, um, not thinking it would necessarily be a big, uh, a big application, but it, it has been. Um, and there are a lot of folks that are, oh, let me close this out, sorry. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks looking to do some pretty interesting things um, with robots in the entertainment space. So pretty cool. Um, I'll, I'll take a quick moment to, to pause if that's helpful. Um, probably have about 10 more minutes of um, presentation, talk a little bit about how the robot operates, um, and then a little bit about different applications. But has this triggered any questions so far from the group? I think that we do all have a lot of questions. Um, maybe I would like to first asking you something. Uh, as we told you with Michelle last time, uh, we're a little bit uh, disappointed uh, by all the robots, you know, and all the advertisements all around the world. Because when you uh, forget the theory and what you see in videos, you see that the uh, practical uh, things are really disappointing. And uh, right now, what are the major industries you are working with in Boston Dynamics yeah. and the spot? Yeah, so I can I can run through that actually. Um, you know, that's sort of the back half of the presentation is talking about like, okay, cool robots, they're fun, they're exciting, but what are we going to do with them? Um, so I think that's the important piece. And and for us, when we first um, released our the what we were referring to as the early adopter program, we were very careful with who was getting access to robots because we wanted to make sure it wasn't just a novelty of like, oh, this is a cool robot, but it's not really doing anything. We wanted it to provide, you know, legitimate value. Um, so let me, let me run through some of the applications that we've seen um, have significant interest. The first application that we really focused on, um, because the environment's very difficult, it's constantly changing. Um, there are wet floors, concrete floors, stairs, all those different obstacles was the construction space. Um, so in construction, folks are doing a couple different things. One, they're using the robots um, to do uh, digital twin capture. So taking as built uh, and comparing them to a BIM model to make sure that uh, construction is, is one, on track, and two, being built as designed to primarily avoid rework. Today, you know, they require a person to go uh, put a 3D laser scanner, wait, let it scan, take it to the next location, let it scan, take it to the next location, let it scan, and then upload it. And what ends up hap happening inevitably is one, you know, it's sort of the last task people want to do. Um, so it, it either doesn't get done. And then if it does get done, uh, people aren't necessarily great at go doing the exact same thing over and over. Um, so they might be in a spot, you know, 10 feet away one one day and then, you know, 15 feet away the next day. Um, whereas robots are really good at following specific instructions and going to a specific location and capturing data. Um, so, you know, more regular data capture and more consistent data capture has been the real value there. 
Um, in addition to that, we work with a company that does 360 um, scans, you know, just visual images to get progress reports for construction sites. So knowing when each subcontractor has completed their piece and, you know, can move on to the next. Um, another industry that's really interesting um, for us is the oil and gas industry. And, you know, a couple of the things that, that people have been testing and focused on are, you know, number one, doing these autonomous rounds and readings. So today there's an operator round and reading every morning or, you know, a couple of times a day where somebody walks around the facility, uh, looks to make sure everything looks normal. Uh, they check to make sure oil is, you know, in, they look at site glass to make sure there's oil for motors. Um, they might feel something or take a thermal image to see if the temperature is running high. Um, they listen to hear if things are normal. Um, you know, but there's two challenges there. One, you're taking, a, you know, a very valuable employee and asking them to just do sort of a walk around in the plant. And then two, it's a subjective reading. So, you know, a lot of the oil and gas companies we work with have two week on, two week off shifts. So the person that comes in for the first two weeks may he be hearing one thing and it just sort of becomes, you know, regularly a little bit worse. Uh, and then the person that comes in the next week just may have a different opinion. It may sound normal to them uh, or, or, you know, they may see the temperature range on something and just think, you know, that's okay. But with, with robotics and analytics, um, you can have really objective readings. So there's a particular, uh, you know, level, whereas if it becomes above this temperature, that opens up a ticket and opens up a work ticket. So that's a really interesting application. Um, the other application that's of interest that we, there's still sort of a little technical hurdle of battery life that we're, you know, working to fix later this year or improve later this year, um, but having a robot live on an offshore oil rig. So, you know, you can just teleoperate into the robot and you can drive it around the facility. Um, so those are some of the applications um, in those industries. In the electric utility industry, similar type of inspection rounds. Um, we work with some nuclear power plants, um, you know, and one thing that they were really interested in is analog gauge reading. So, you know, when I first heard that, I, I initially said, well, why not just put in digital gauges sort of ignorantly? Uh, but even just to run the cabling in the plant is extremely expensive. And there are security aspects of having digital gauge versus analog gauges. So, you know, the idea of now putting a computer vision model that reads gauges on top of spot, going around and collecting that data and then uploading it to an Excel sheet or a trending software uh, is really interesting. Uh, the, another thing in the nuclear industry is going into the containment area, reducing the dose rate for employees. So we've had spot into a 3,500 millirem per hour environment. Um, this is something that, you know, people wouldn't go in there. Uh, and, you know, you can get a better inspection. Um, they can scan places that they haven't been in a long time. Uh, another thing in the utility space, they have these valve halls or these converter stations that are that are converting AC to DC power, um, and people aren't allowed in there when they run it. So sending a robot to do inspections, you know, for gas leaks, visual inspections, thermal inspections, can be really interesting for them. In the mining space, um, it comes back to the security application. So a pre-blast or a post-blast inspection to make sure. Um, that everything is safe for people to go in. Right now, if they are sending a person in, they're looking around, maybe they're doing a scan, maybe they're taking some readings, uh, but that's a dangerous time to be in a mine is right after a blast. So having a robot go in there in the person's place is really interesting. A um, Couple other applications, uh, the public safety space, you know, getting sort of a visual eyes on an environment or uh, chemical, biological, radiological uh, sensors mounted on a robot to go into a crime scene or something like that uh, has been an uh, application of interest. Healthcare is one that we really never thought of when we first built the robot, but it, it played out to the fact that we built Spot to be an open platform. Um, so for COVID response, we had a hospital in Boston uh, that mounted an iPad on the robot 
uh, along with the communications and they were doing sort of custom, uh, in, intake for patients uh, to save PPE gear, sort of reduce the amount of interactions um, between the hospital staff and a patient. Um, and interestingly enough, patients preferred the, the robot interaction, um, which we didn't know how that would play out. Um, but people, you know, patients didn't necessarily want to be any close to healthcare workers any more than a healthcare worker wanted to be close to, to a patient when they first came in, just from a safety standpoint. A um, couple other things, and then I'll open it up to questions. So the entertainment piece, like I shared, uh, and then sort of the just general research. So we've got a lot of folks uh, that are focused on doing autonomous missions, you know, going into an environment that you've never seen before uh, and getting to the top of a mountain. Um, or, you know, JPL and, and NASA uh, worked with us in the subterranean challenge, the DARPA subterranean challenge, um, to basically go through, uh, you know, an old nuclear facility and be able to navigate and go find different waypoints uh, in a pretty autonomous fashion. So those are some of the different applications that we're seeing. Um, you know, I'll show you, I can show you sort of one more little bit of a video and then I'll, let me open it up to questions. So this is, uh, this is just an example of sort of how the robot operates. Uh, so you can control it with a uh, joystick controller. You can see sort of what the robot sees with those stereo cameras. Um, another important thing here is, is it is making decisions on its own in the sense that you hit the joystick cam the joystick forward, the robot's just going to walk forward. You don't need to tell it where to put its feet. Uh, from an obstacle avoidance standpoint, even if you try to drive the robot, you know, into a wall or into something that's above 30 centimeters, it is automatically going to avoid it. Um, so you'll see that here in a moment where you know, there, he's trying to drive the robot into this wall and it's just sort of standing in place. Or as it walks past this pipe, um, it's gonna automatically walk around and then lift its foot up and over another object. So the operator is not doing anything there. The robot's sort of making that decision on its own. Um, and I'll show, let me show one more video actually. So this is another case, you know, cause that's a pretty flat ground, pretty easy. This, a customer set up sort of like an obstacle course for us and asked, you know, can the robot maneuver this? And you'll see the robot's legs are gonna move really fast as it slips just to try to stay up right here. Um, so it, it understands where it is in relation to the world. It has sensors on its feet. Uh, and this is, no one's driving the robot at this point. We sent it along this path and asked it to just go repeat it, the path. So it knows to step up and over this. Um, it knows sort of what it can step on. Um, you know, what it needs to avoid, all those types of things. Uh, so uh, with that, I will uh, take a moment to pause and then hopefully, um, you know, there are some questions and we can run through that for the next few minutes. Was that interesting, Mel? No? Any questions, guys, about the research, what Boston Dynamics is accomplishing? So you... I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Charlie. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, first, thank you for this presentation. It was really interesting. Um, when you say that it reacts to the environment, it's mainly based on visual cues, right? You're not doing anything regarding proprioception yet. So uh, let me show you this. Is this is sort of how this is how the robot sees the world. This is sort of like a simple view. Um, so the robot doesn't have object identification built yeah. in. It's seeing the world based on form factors and, you know, what it can step on, what's flat ground or what's not. Um, okay. And this is another, another example, right? So voxel map on the right. And this is sort of how the robot is seeing the world. And this is it following the waypoints and going along a particular path that we've asked it for. But it doesn't really have object identification. That being mm -hmm. said, you could integrate uh, computer vision model, object identification, you know, via the SDK and then have the robot, you know, if it sees this, go towards it or avoid it or something like that. Uh, so there's a, you know, the application of last hundred feet delivery 
um, is really interesting. And technically the robot can get and walk up a set of stairs and drop a package. Um, but the robot doesn't know not to walk on a flower bed today. Okay. You know, it sees that as something so perfectly no, fine to there's walk no on. Haptic, yeah. There's no haptic uh, feedback or proprioception feelings. Yeah. It's really mapping visually. Correct. Not built into the robot, but we do have um, customers, you know, the gesture command folks that have basically integrated uh, different gesture commands are working on sort of haptic um, understanding of sort of like feedback from what the robot's getting. And then okay. we are looking to release an arm early next year. Um, mm -hmm. That'll have force control. So that will understand, you know, how hard it needs to pull um, and push on something. So, um, let me see if I've got a quick video to give you an idea. Yeah, so here, here's a, a quick idea on um, how the arm will operate. So you can sort of see it opening doors. And this is a closed loop um, control. So we're basically saying open the door and the robot's figuring out the strategy for how to open the door. Okay, thank you. Sure thing, any other uh, questions that I can answer. Are you developing your own um, SDK or facial recognition programs or are you working with partners for this? Yeah, so we have a developer platform, you know, with a Python based SDK um, that has the hooks in, you know, we're not specific, particularly focused on facial recognition. Um, but, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't integrate a facial recognition camera on top of the mm -hmm. robot. Uh, you know, that's the whole point of making it an open platform or like a thermal camera, a 3D scanner, you know, Trimble or Faro or Leica makes better 3D scanners than we, when, than we would make. So using them, mounting that on top of the robot um, makes a lot of sense to us. Same thing with facial recognition or sort of uh, computer vision, machine learning type models. Mm -hmm. So Charlie or Mohamed, I hope that you are going to work uh, on your proposals uh, with Boston yeah. Dynamics. The robots are super exciting. Matthew, yeah, what's your, what are the next projects? It's Atlas or something else, or maybe it's classified, like in a good American uh, movie? <laughs> yeah, so, so um, the, you know, we aren't uh, actively pursuing uh, commercializing Atlas at any point. We do have a product in the logistics space uh, that's focused on sort of depalletizing boxes. Um, so the logistics space is sort of interesting to us in that sense. Uh, but yeah, Atlas, I don't, I don't think we're going to commercialize that anytime soon. Mm -hmm. You know, we so do think at some point, right now. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we think at some point there will be different morphologies of spot, you know, it's over engineered and under engineered for every task. So mm -hmm. in the oil and gas industry, as an example, you know, having an intrinsically safe robot would be very valuable, but it would be a new robot. You know, we'd, it would be a redesign. Um, so, you know, but, but that might be something that we are interested in exploring at some point mm -hmm. or for the delivery package, like, you know, the robot as it is today is over engineered for carrying mm -hmm. a five pound package and dropping it at your door. So maybe we could, you know, value engineer something uh, that is a little bit less expensive that could sort of uh, scale out easier. So those are some of the ideas, but there's nothing in the immediate, um, you know, pipeline for now spot is really the focus. Mm -hmm. so you only have three more minutes. Uh, I have a last question after. Uh, other questions, guys? Nobody? Nope. They are all impressed, Matthew, that's why. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and let me uh, present. Hopefully it was interesting. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of good content online. You know, we so became famous because of our YouTube videos, I feel like. Uh, but hopefully you see after today, there's more to it. And Matthew, just the last thing before you're uh, leaving. Uh, everybody knows that we have written with Michelle an article about uh, artificial intelligence and a small robot for luxury industry. Uh, so it's online right now on the Harvard Business Review. We have to tell you that we have tried to contact um, Boston Dynamics for around two years, but it was not in their principle to commercialize at this time. So Matthew was the first uh, guy, uh, 
um, who's now the head of sales. So now they are really focused on commercializing their robots, especially the spot. Uh, that's why we will try, uh, because you know, we have an Emirates project with Mr. Shaloub, and uh, we want to uh, work with uh, Matthew uh, as soon as we can. But that's why we, uh, the, the difference, the time difference was not the right timing, you know? So now I hope that we are uh, going to work with Matthew. This is uh, my conclusion. Yeah, yeah, it would be great. We're definitely uh, looking forward to it. So, yeah, thank you all so much for taking the time. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, definitely excited to see sort of uh, what's to come next. We do think sort of the best is yet to come. Um, and we are really excited to see what different partners develop on top of spot. We can so. upload uh, Matthew. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. Appreciate you taking the time today. Bye, Matthew. All right, take care. Thank <laughs> you.